Welcome to all of you. If you have zoomed in for the Denton's webinar on carbon border adjustments, you are in the right place. I am Gail Leone. I'm a senior counsel at Denton's located in our Washington DC office. Prior to joining Denton's, I was general counsel of three international companies. The most recent and probably the most fun was Harley Davidson. At Denton's, I currently co-chair our Denton's ESG uh, US Task Force, and I'm a member of our Global ESG Steering Committee. So I'm very interested in learning from the experts we have assembled here today. A few housekeeping points. Um, we're gonna start our uh, briefing this morning with some background on CBAM and a public discussion of the policy to date. That will be followed by a panel discussion exploring some of the more global implications of EU carbon border adjustment. And then we'll have Q&A. Uh, if you wanna ask a question, please use the Q&A function and we will try our best to get to all of those um, at the end of the webinar. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. We all know that the focus on climate change mitigation is really intensifying. We have the UN Climate Change Conference, or COP26, later this year, and companies are recognizing the increasing urgency of the ESG agenda. It's pushed by investors like BlackRock, um, consumers, and other stakeholders. Uh, even Lamborghini yesterday announced their new environmental sustainability route that will lead to decarbonization of all of its future models. Climate change is a global problem. That is the real challenge. Emissions of greenhouse gases everywhere are a problem, anywhere are a problem everywhere. Um, but we're very unlikely to get a global legally binding agreement or solution to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050 as we really need to. This was pretty clear um, uh, six years ago, which is why the Paris Agreement developed a process for countries setting and updating so-called nationally determined contributions or NDCs to reduce emissions. NDCs tend to focus on territorial emissions. So for example, the UK can take measures that reduce emissions from industry within their borders. This results in some polluting UK factories closing or switching to cleaner, more expensive production methods. But demand from consumers and businesses remains and ends up being satisfied by factories in other countries with less tough regulations. Today, we wanna to talk about carbon border adjustments, which may be a way to avoid the situation where regulatory action in one country just displaces emissions rather than reducing them overall at a global level. So let's explore this possible solution. We have two wonderful experts with broad experience in the law and in government who will explain how carbon border adjustments work and how the EU is proposing to legislate in this area. Mark Clough, QC, is a senior counsel in Denton's Brussels office. He has been advising clients for 40 years and representing them before the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Court on a variety of EU law issues ranging from competition and mergers to state aid, public procurement, as well as environment and climate change rules. Having worked in both the Commission and the European Parliament, he has also focused on lobbying the EU institutions when clients need advice and support. Mark is the main representative of the Denton's Brussels office on the EU institutions lobbying register. Celine Van Laird is a business and EU compliance lawyer in our Brussels office, where she notably advises energy sector clients on a wide range of corporate and compliance issues. Before joining Denton's, she worked in diplomacy and the legal sector in both Malaysia and in India. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Gail. Could I have the first, uh, the next slide, please? Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Celine and I, are in this first section of the webinar, are going to provide an overview of the current EU focus on the carbon border adjustment mechanism, known as the CBAM. 
It is, arises in the context of the underlying EU Green Deal policy and the EU emissions trading system, otherwise known as the ETS. First, you will see uh, from this first slide that the Green Deal covers all the policies to produce a climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. That's the EU's underlying green transition policy. The CBAM, as you see on the left, in, in the columns on the left-hand side of this slide, is one of the key elements. Second, the EU ETS is an example, uh, sorry, is expected to be extended to apply to imports in the forms, form of the CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Third, international the dimension is founded by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change with, with the seminal 1995 Paris Agreement that Gail has already mentioned, known as COP21, and soon to be followed up by the latest meeting in Glasgow in November 2021, known as COP26. COP26, perhaps uh, together with the European Parliament's recent resolution that I'm going to discuss later on CBAM has um, wakened, I think, industry and government's interest, as reflected even today in the Financial Times, which has the headline, Russian businesses face heavy hit from EU carbon tax scheme. And it, it starts off by saying Russian companies stand to be among the biggest losers from the EU's proposed carbon tax on imports, prompting accusations of protectionism from Moscow. It specifically refers to a company a group called EN Plus, an energy company that controls Rusal, Russia's largest aluminium producer, and which mainly uses hydro, hydro power, which urged the Commission to take a softer approach. Roussel said it should be a push, but also a motivation with a support mechanism. It doesn't have to be so tough that it kills business. Well, that's the big question, perhaps for debate this afternoon, but certainly for the foreseeable future. Next um, uh, slide, please. Uh, here we have the, uh, uh, the summary of the Green Deal uh, and its, um, it, its uh, high-level uh, climate policies. The EU is required to be a fair and prosperous society with a modern, efficient and comp competitive economy. By 2050, as I've already said, Europe should be the first climate neutral continent. And by 2030, it's going to reduce carbon emissions by 55%. The um, key carbon decarbonisation priorities involve uh, the e EU energy intensive industries that need to make substantial investments in new plant in order to reduce emissions. The, um, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the green recovery and the just transition refer to the, uh, the, the sideline policies, uh, recovery of course reflecting the COVID crisis and the, the massive funding that the EU like the US is making available for the economic recovery and putting a, a large investment into green uh, developments. And the just transition reflects the need to use perhaps the income from the CBAM to finance uh, small businesses and lesser developed areas of Europe to comply with climate change laws. And then the relevant legislative uh, initiatives. We, we start with the climate law uh, that sets the EU emissions targets. The 2018 directive is the current version of that, but will be amended this year in the, in the Commission's uh, review process. And then the EU uh, emissions trading system, the carbon pricing regime. It's that which is proposed to be expanded to cover the CBAM. And there are other related um, uh, legislation. Uh, next slide, please. We, um, we, we saw, incidentally, that uh, 
one of the one of the policy objectives uh, of the um, the European Union is to try to prevent carbon leakage. Carbon leakage is a term to describe the prospect of an increase in global greenhouse gas emissions when a company shifts production or investment outside the EU, because in the absence of a legally binding international climate agreement, they are unable to pass on the cost increases induced by the EU emissions trading system to their customers without losing market share. There are a number of mechanisms uh, that uh, address this, in particular two, to mitigate the risk of carbon leakage. One uh, is the use of what are called free allowances, and the second is the, the use of uh, compensation for indirect costs in those industries which are heavily dependent on uh, uh, electricity and energy. In the context of the EU uh, emissions trading system, we can see that it covers the entire EU and indeed the EEA as it's called. Uh, that includes Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Uh, it, um, it was set up in 2005 as a cornerstone of the EU's policy to combat climate change and its key, its key tool for reducing greenhouse gas emissions cost effectively. It's the world's first major carbon market and remains the biggest one. It operates in all the countries that I've mentioned and limits emissions from more than 11,000 heavy energy using installations, power stations and industrial plants, and airlines operating between the EU and EEA countries, covering around 40% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. The EU ETS works on the cap and trade principle. The cap is set on the total amount of greenhouse gases that can be uh, emitted by installations covered by the system. The cap is reduced over time so that total emissions fall. Within the cap, companies receive or buy emission allowances, which they can trade with one another as needed. They can also buy limited amounts of international credits from emission saving projects around the world. The limit on the total number of allowances available ensures that they have value. After each year, a company must surrender enough allowances to cover all its emissions. Otherwise, heavy fines may be imposed. The member states of the EU are required to uh, supervise the ETS and to have uh, uh, regulators who implement the, the, the rules at the national level and have the power to impose penalties. If a company reduces its emissions, it can keep the spare allowances to cover its future needs or else sell, sell them to another company that is short of allowances. Trading brings flexibility that ensures emissions are cut where it costs least to do so. A robust carbon price also promotes investment in clean and low technologies. In that FT article I referred to today, they point out that the carbon price has now become 50 US dollars. We'll see in a, a 50 euros, sorry. We'll see in a, in a moment that that is double the price of 2019 and uh, nearly four times what it was in uh, 2013 when the statistics were, were, were um, put into the picture I'm going to show you in a moment. So um, the, the uh, way the cap and trade uh, uh, system works is that tradable emission allowances are allocated to market participants with a, via a mixture of free allocation and auctions. One allowance gives the holder the right, as you can see on this slide, to emit one, two, one ton sorry, of CO2 or its equivalent. Participants covered by the EU ETS must monitor and report their emissions each year and surrender enough emission allowances to cover their annual emissions. Participants who are likely to emit more than their allocation have a choice between taking measures to reduce their emissions through technological advances or buying additional allowances, either from the secondary market, for example, companies who hold allowances they do not need, or from the member held member state held auctions, which are subject, of course, to the EU law. 
It doesn't matter where, in terms of physical location, emission reductions are made because emissions savings have the same environmental effect wherever they are made. And the rationale behind emissions trading is that it enables emission reductions to play, take place where the cost of reduction is lower, lowest, lessening the overall cost of tackling climate change. Next slide, please. <coughs> Here we see a, a, a summary of the uh, evolution over time, the four phases of the ETS, and this pricing graph that I mentioned that shows how the uh, emissions price plummeted uh, and uh, has only recently started going up. But the pressure on business, uh, as interestingly recorded in the FT today, has driven the price up already to 50 euro. Economists say the price needs to be 250 uh, euro for the climate change policy of reducing carbon emissions to zero by 2050 to succeed. The, the, um, the, the third phase of the EU ETS ran up to the end of 2020. Uh, the, the phase one is complete and phase two uh, <coughs> as if you like led on now to what, what is going to be phase four. The main changes from the previous two phases in at the third stage were a single EU wide cap on emissions was applied in place of the previous system of national caps and auctioning has become the default method for allocating allowances instead of free allocation and that, that the auctions are subject to harmonized rules. Participation in the EU ETS is mandatory for companies in the qualifying sectors but in some sectors only plants above certain sizes are included and certain small installations can be excluded if governments put in place fiscal or other measures that will cut their emission, emissions by an equivalent amount. The, the, um, the, 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 the actual sectors covered uh, uh, in, include power and heat generation, energy intensive industry sectors such as oil refineries, steel works, production of iron, aluminium, metals, cement, lime, glass, ceramics, pulp, paper, cardboard, ASICs, acids, and bulk organic chemicals, last but not least. But in addition, there is commercial aviation and nitrous oxide, or NO2, from production of nitric, adipic, and glyoxylic acids, and glyoxyl perfluorocarbons, PFCs, from aluminium production. Uh, next slide, please. I'm now going to hand over to Celine, uh, who's going to uh, just for the, uh, the timetable and, and uh, legislative process. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. In order to provide you with a better overview of what's coming next, we will highlight the likely shape of proposals and path to implementation. Next slide, please. The idea of a CBAM is not new, as you can see. There were already French proposals to explore a CBAM in the EU ETS 12 years ago. But more recently, it has been flagged as part of the overall EU Green Deal package since the president of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, came in in 2019. In March of this year, the European Parliament adopted a resolution which is his checklist for a WTO compatible EU CBAM. And Mark will explain further in a minute. We are currently waiting for the Commission legislative proposal. It was originally scheduled for June of this year, but has been postponed to mid July. The CBAM resolution could, be, could come into force as early as 2023. Next slide, please. So you will be relieved to hear that we are not going to talk to this slide in any detail. We just want to let you know that once the commission issues this proposal, it will be the subject of the usual parallel debates among national governments, meaning the council, and the directly elected European Parliament, ultimately concluding in a three-way agreement between the council, the parliament, and the commission. As the chart shows, this can be quite a lengthy process, but it is also a process that provides interested parties 
with a lot of opportunities to influence the debate by lobbying national delegations, members of the parliament or the commission at various points. Next slide, please. The commission ran a consultation on the idea of a CBAM last year, so 2020, and it was an open consultation, meaning that the commission did not advance any specific proposal. We can see here some of the quantitative results from the consultation, for instance, the form of a CBAM that is most likely to be adopted, so the one based on the EU ETS in some way, was not the one that was most popular with consultees. Also, people generally favored a CBAM that took account of direct and indirect emissions associated with manufacture. Slightly fewer respondents wanted to include emissions from international transports of goods and the whole value chain. In the last column, we can see which sectors responded were keenest on including within the scope of CBAM, possibly reflecting those sectors that are perceived to be at greatest risk of carbon leakage. Next slide, please. For the Parliament's resolution adopted in March, I will revert to Mark. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh, now, finally, on this introductory section, <coughs> I want to highlight this very important resolution of the European Parliament uh, on the 10th of March this year, because it effectively instructs the European Commission what it should do in its forthcoming proposal. In particular, it emphasizes that the, uh, the, the CBAM should be WTO compatible and not discriminate against imports. The resolution underlines that the EU's increased ambition on climate change must not lead to carbon leakage as global climate efforts will not benefit if EU production is just moved to non-EU countries that have less ambitious emission rules. As I've explained, carbon leakage is the main driver uh, in one sense uh, to, to uh, the current approach to controlling imports in the EU in order to achieve the, the net zero carbon ambition. M MEPs, members of the European Parliament, therefore support putting a carbon price on certain goods imported from outside the EU if these countries are not ambitious enough about climate change. This would create a global level playing field as well as an incentive for the EU and non-EU industries to decarbonize in line with the Paris objectives. And uh, as this slide says in the third section, the CBM is to be based uh, on a reformed EU ETS with a separate pool of allowances for importers uh, with pricing following the EU ETS price. It will cover all products and commodities in the EU ETS, but it would start with the power sector and energy intensive sectors, covering 94% of EU industrial emissions. Next slide, please. As I said, the emphasis on Avoiding a trade war is very important for the Parliament and to be fair, so to the European Commission. MEPs stress that it should be a WTO compatible and not misused as a tool to enhance protectionism. It must therefore be designed specifically to meet climate objectives. Another aspect of the Parliament's policy proposals are that revenues generated should be used as part of a basket of own revenues to boost support for the objectives of the Green Deal under the EU budget. As you can see from the slide under the heading use of proceeds, the revenues from the CBAM uh, are, 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 are valued between five, 5 and 14 billion euro. And uh, therefore there's considerable resources that might be available. Uh, for the just transition, as I mentioned earlier. And in terms of implementation, the, the uh, Parliament recommends that the Commission should have a clear and ambitious timeline. Now that's an important factor because it's already slipped from June to July. And there are those who are wondering whether in fact this, the Commission's proposal may even wait until after the November COP26. I'm going to stop there and we'll be happy, uh, Sadine and myself, to 
address any questions that you might have later. Back to you, Gail, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Celine, for that really excellent briefing on CBAMs. Um, now let's turn to our panel to understand additional challenges uh, to articulating these EU proposals. Vikram already mentioned at the start how Russia is reacting to them, but let's also understand how other countries around the world might look at them. Let's take the, go to the next slide. I think we need to move the slides forward. Perfect. Um, we have a terrific panel uh, that I'd like to introduce. Um, Vikram uh, Balanchandra is a manager at Frontier Economics based in their Brussels office where he advises energy sector clients on a range of issues with a focus on EU energy and climate policy. Adam Brown is an energy lawyer in our London office. Before joining Dentons, he represented the UK government in many negotiations on EU legislative proposals. Nancy Sun is a China qualified transaction lawyer and a registered foreign lawyer in Singapore, located in our Dentons Shanghai office. She advises chemical, energy, and financial companies in M&A, joint ventures, investments, and other cross-border transactions, including uh, the environmental implications of them. Nancy has a deep understanding of China's carbon finance and carbon emission trading market and environmental compliance issues. She is a former in-house counsel, like myself, of a Hong Kong listed public company. And last but not least, Adam Shaw is a partner in the Denton's public policy practice, actually in the same office I am in DC, where he focuses primarily on energy, environmental and cross-border issues. He uses his knowledge and experience of Congress and the executive branch to provide clients with guidance on federal legislative and regulatory issues, including Clean Air Act regulations, climate change mitigation and adaption. He's also on our US ESG task force. I will turn it over to Vikram if you'd like to start the uh, panel conversation. Mark and Celine have given us an introduction to what CBAM looks like um, as a legal and to some extent political project. I know that many economists favor carbon pricing in general as a way to tackle climate change and that carbon border adjustments are a bit more controversial. So what do you think are the real practical and technical challenges in designing a CBAM scheme that works as it should? Thanks very much, Gail. Uh, and thanks to Dentons for inviting me to speak today. I think it's the first time I've been part of a panel that spans so many time zones. Um, <laughs> could we turn to the next slide, please? So uh, I'd just like to take things a step back because I think it'll be helpful, I think, in the, in the later panel discussion. Um, so the, the underlying problem is as described by Gail uh, and by Mark and Celine, which is the carbon leakage issue driven by differences in carbon prices between jurisdictions. Um, now, I won't get into the debate on whether or not there is evidence for carbon leakage actually happening. Um, that, that is hotly contested. Um, but clearly looking forward, as Mark mentioned, we, we have a, a European carbon price at record highs, um, that that's gonna strengthen any concerns that industry and policymakers might have. Now, there are two broad categories of approach for mitigating the problem and for ensuring a level playing field. The first category of approach is referred to as shielding. An, exa an example of that is the EU policy, um, so the, e um, the EU policy referred to by Mark, whereby affected sectors that are subject to the emissions trading scheme that's subject to the carbon price are given some kind of um, compensation, in, in this case, in the form of allowances granted to them for free based on historical emissions. Uh, and, and actually the UK is proposing a similar approach for its emissions trading scheme. Now, that ensures uh, a level playing field, and as you can see in this diagram, both um, for 
um, goods consumed within the EU um, in that goods coming in, so imports, which may not face the full carbon price, um, are, are then on a level playing field with domestic production. It also assumes that it also uh, ensures that exports from the EU um, are, are relieved of the carbon price going out uh, that they face within the EU. Um, and, and so going out um, to other countries, uh, they're also on a level playing field. So it ensures a, le a level playing field in theory, um, but in practice, um, the EU approach to free allocation will become increasingly less effective over time. So in the EU, companies that receive free allowances still have to purchase a percentage of the allowances they require. So they don't get all the allowances they need for free. Uh, and I'll save you the details, but the rules mean, uh, the ETS rules mean that that percentage is likely to go up um, as the ETS cap declines, just while we see the prices at record highs. And as Mark mentioned, it's projected to increase yet further. The subsidy approach is also economically inefficient um, as it works against the main objective of climate protection. So rather than leading to higher prices for emissions intensive goods, it leads to lower prices and therefore less abatement. And since um, instead of being able to auction the permits and get revenues from them, um, governments have to um, give, give, give the permits for free. There's then less scope to reduce other taxes um, which also hurts the economy. Now, can we just click one more time, please? So we can contrast this now to how a border tax adjustment would work. Um, and th this can really be thought of as analogous to a value added tax or a sales tax. Um, and, and just like a value added tax, um, so the goods exported from the EU would be exempted from paying the tax. Um, and, and so in that respect, the system would be similar, at least at a conceptual level, to the current approach based on free allocation. The difference would be that goods coming in would face the full EU carbon price on their embodied emissions. So in a sense, the system assumes um, that as is the case for sales taxes, the exporting country relieves their exports from any carbon taxes that apply locally in their jurisdiction. So again, it ensures a level playing field, but it's crucially, it's not one uh, that's constrained this by the declining ETS gap. Um, so you, you have a, a full shield rather than a shield with holes in. Um, and it's also an approach that ensures the full carbon price is reflected in the price of goods, uh, emissions intensive goods consumed within the EU, uh, at least if you can get the details right. And maybe we can turn to that later. Okay. Uh Nancy, um, both Mark and Vikram talked about carbon leakage. Um, when others, not Vikram or Mark, talk about carbon leakage, they often use China as a shorthand for countries whose less tightly regulated manufacturing sectors will be emitting carbon instead of factories in the EU or, or the UK, for example. Um, but of course, China now has its own emissions trade system. So I'd love to have you talk a little bit about how soon could we expect that uh, China's ETS create a carbon price of similar strength to the EU's? And in the meantime, how might Chinese businesses respond to the EU uh, CBAM? Yeah, thank you very much, Gail. Uh, and um, uh, hello everyone. And I'm very happy to share uh, the development of China's ETS uh, market. And um, China has actually started developing its ETS since uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. The first phase was setting up pilot re regional ETS. Up to today, there are nine regional pilot markets, aggregate 2,833 controlled entities, 1,082 non-controlled entities and more than 11,000 individuals participate the regional ETS by uh, September 2020. In each of the regional ETS, the products being traded are allowances and CCER. And CCER is a kind of a voluntary emission reduction certified by the Chinese government agency. 
the allowances are allocated by the respective local government for free based on their respective local historical data and reduction targets. Accumulatively, the trading volume has um, exceeded uh, 400 million ton and total value is more than 9 billion Chinese yuan by May last um, August. However, each of the regional ETS is isolated and the uh, standards and pricing are different from one another. And due to no leakage between the um, regional pilot ETS and the limitation of the local participants, the liquidity of those regional pilot markets is not very high. And starting from uh, 2016, the Chinese central government believed that it would be the good timing to uh, set up the national ETS so probably as early as possible based on the uh, experience of the regional pilots accumulated in the last in the past years. So we are actually uh, in the process of transitioning into the unified national ETS. At the end of uh, 2017, NDRC announced a development plan for national ETS which lays out um, three steps for the national ETS development. The first step is to build up the foundation of the national ETS, which is to develop unified national data reporting system, uh, allowance allocation and registration system and trading system, as well as the carbon market um, regulatory system. And in the past three years, the central government has released the fundamental regulations um, and uh, measures, and it has also decided Hubei province and Shanghai are responsible for registration and trading system respectively. So far, the first step has almost completed. And then second step is to conduct a simulated round of uh, national ETS. Um, at the beginning, only uh, electricity uh, industry will participate in national ETS. There will be around uh, 2,200 uh, electricity companies covered. Even though only electricity industry to be involved, they actually account for 9% of the global emission and 20% to 40% of China emission. The national ETS um, is expected to start running at the end of this June. Um, and the last step would be further deepen and a perfect the national ETS after its launch and operation uh, and having more industries, not only the um, electricity industry as um, it operates uh, at the very beginning and the more industries such like uh, uh, petrochemical, steel, non-ferrous aviation uh, and having those industries uh, participant into the market. And it is anticipated that in uh, 2025, the trading model may reach uh, 3 billion ton, and the Chinese government has already committed to uh, reach um, carbon peak in 2030 and carbon neutral in 2060. Um, it is believed that the national ETS is a very important mechanism for achieving this goal. Um, and uh, having said that, even though China is um, developing its own national ETS, but it is still at a quite early stage. As mentioned just now at the very beginning uh, of the national ETS, only electricity industry will be involved. However, the EU ETS started uh, as early as 2005 and now getting into its fourth phase. It covers many industries such as energy, uh, petrochemical, steel, glass, uh, ceramics, paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In addition to the carbon dioxide, the PFCs is also covered uh, as well. Um, so to have the China ETS have equivalent market or control over the carbon emission as it has in the EU, um, it may uh, need to take some time probably uh, like a, a few years after its launch this June to get into its third phase, gra gradually covering more industries and more kinds of uh, um, greenhouse gas. Um, so, so hopefully when the CBAM com comes into effect as planned in uh, two, 2023, China's national ETS can be further developed and can, can build up uh, equivalent 
uh, market as uh, it has in the EU. But the progress um, may be affected by many factors. We still need to wait and see. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Nancy. So we've heard what's happening in China. Uh, Adam, let's take a look at what's going on in the UK. And of course, the UK um, holds right now the presidency of COP26. Um, but now that Brexit is complete, um, the UK obviously won't be part of the EU's proposed um, CBAM. Uh, but since leaving the EU, um, it has created a carbon pricing regime that looks very much like the EU ETS. Um, do you think it will also follow the EU's lead on CBAM as well? Hi. Hello, Lauren. Thanks, Gail. Yes. So just by way of background, the, um, the carbon pricing debate in the UK has obviously been dominated by Brexit for the last few years. Uh, but long before Brexit, um, 10 years ago, the UK was worried that the, the weak decarbonisational signals that were coming from the EU, EU ETS at the time, and it, uh, it actually imposed its own levies, supplementary levies on fossil fuel use in UK power stations. So those commentators who take the view that a straight tax is always better and simpler way to uh, price carbon than a cap and trade system, uh, were a bit disappointed when uh, a couple of years ago, the UK came to, came to consult on its future of UK carbon pricing and what, what would it do after Brexit? Because the proposal was just to create a UK ETS modelled on the EU ETS and possibly linked to it. Um, uh, that is, in fact, the route the UK has gone on to follow, although it was a curious kind of wobble last year because the government got into a position where it actually paved the way both for an emissions trading system um, like the EU and also for a straight new carbon emissions tax uh, with a similar scope. And it's only made it clear uh, quite late last year that it was going to be the, the ETS route that would actually go forward. In the meantime, as we've heard, EU allowance prices have broken the 50, 50 euro barrier, uh, and everyone's waiting to see what price will be set in the first auction of UK allowances, which is actually going to take place tomorrow. Um, unlike the EU regime, the UK wants a price floor set at uh, £22, um, but it also has a, a kind of um, mechanism at the other end of, of, of things as well, because if the price stays above uh, um, this oddly precise sum of £44.74 um, for three consecutive months, uh, the government can seek to reduce it by making more lapses available. And that trigger obviously would be reached if um, the UK price tracks the EU price and the EU price you know, carries on um, carries on. Uh, uh, going up as it has done. Do you but, think that will happen? Well, I, 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 it's going to be very exciting to see um, tomorrow. I think people, a, lot, a lot of people do think that it, it, it is likely to have you know, to, 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 be, to be close to the, the EU price. Um, I think it's a less liquid market amongst other things. Mm -hmm. The, um, the post-Brexit EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement requires the EU and the UK to cooperate on carbon pricing and to give serious consideration to linking their carbon pricing systems. Uh, you've also got a non-regression uh, obligation on both sides as regard their carbon pricing regimes the date the agreement was entered into. So if you linked the UK and the EU ETS, and if the UK as well as the EU had a um, CBAM, you would want to link those two. The question is, you know, how big are, how big are those ifs? Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a precedent for, for linking um, EU, uh, EU and other ETSs, the Swiss and the EU ETS, e Swiss uh, ETS and the EU are linked. Well, that took a while. But there are various signs that people are getting interested in, um, in a CBAM in the UK. There's no official government policy on it, but you've got influential think tanks um, publishing things that say this, is, this, is, this would be a good thing to do. Assume that all carbon intensive goods consumed in the UK face the same carbon price and protect the UK's domestic heavy industry from unfair international competition. That's particularly resonant at the moment because you have a lot of policies that are aimed at the um, sort of old industrial heartlands in the north of England, uh, which are quite high carbon industrial heartlands, which have become uh, supporters of the current government. And obviously it, it, it could be um, something that would protect those industries as the government seeks to, to make them greener uh, by doing things like supporting carbon capture and storage, uh, if, it, if it could do things that would, uh, that would you know, help to, to uh, uh, keep the playing field level or 
to use the band phrase, protect them from competition uh, from, uh, from the outside. Uh, and there, there, there'll be a number of you know, other reports from sort of uh, you know, public sector think tanks and, uh, and academics and things you know, pointing out the, the merits of the thing. Uh, CBAM for the UK. And finally, there's COP26. Now, the UK wants to make big client policy gestures while the world is watching as it, as it chairs this, this conference. It's not clear there's bandwidth in government to do more than actually just promise to start looking at a CBAM rather than actually develop the policy. But actually, that might be the res right result at the moment because you, know, you let the EU make the early running. And as, uh, as UK diplomats used to like to say in EU negotiations, uh, we'll come in behind the French. Uh, uh, Lean may have a comment on that. <laughs> um, continuing our span of the globe, uh, Andrew, uh, the Biden administration has been busy making up for lost time in the area of climate action. Almost everything they're doing now has some focus on climate change. The SEC is all over it, all the other agencies. I uh, just heard the Secretary of Transportation this morning focused on it. Um, but the U.S. has no national carbon pricing regime, and it doesn't look like uh, as if that's likely to change anytime soon. So do you think uh, from a timing perspective, do you think uh, the U.S. looking at the COP26 that we'd much rather wait and see, uh, uh, have them delay any move on the CBAM so we can catch up or where do you think CBAM sits in the broader context of the EU-US relations, in particular around climate change policy? Well, well thanks for the question, Gail, and, and great to be with uh, such a distinguished panel, and thanks for all the guests. Uh, the short answer to your question uh, is that the Biden administration would uh, prefer that the EU defer moving forward on their CBAM until after COP26. Uh, John Kerry, who is now the special uh, presidential envoy for climate, uh, made that very clear in his initial meetings uh, with EU officials in March uh, in, in talking about broader action on climate change. Uh, with respect to the second part of your question, uh, climate change uh, and uh, cooperation on CBAM I think is a really integral part of the Biden administration's uh, strategy for working with the EU more broadly. You know, Gail referenced this in, in, in her question, but we really have seen a, a complete shift uh, in the US uh, engagement internationally uh, and their policies domestically on climate change. Uh, the Biden administration is employing a, a whole of government approach and on foreign policy uh, and trade, that is putting climate change really uh, at the center uh, of uh, the discussion uh, when it comes to US-EU relations and US relations uh, with their allies. And I think the Biden administration, uh, their uh, perspective is to work to repair damage, whether real or perceived, uh, with the EU and other allies in trying to build momentum and put pressure on, on other uh, large emitters uh, ahead of COP26. Uh, we saw that uh, with President Biden's uh, International Climate Leaders Summit uh, last month uh, held virtually in DC. And I think we'll see more of the, the efforts to try to work collaboratively broadly with the EU, Canada, the UK and others on climate change in the months ahead of, of COP26. Uh, with respect to the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, it's important to, to recognize that uh, President Biden uh, during last year's campaign uh, called for an adoption of, of a carbon adjustment as part of his broader uh, climate plan. I think it's, it's uh, important to note that there are several uh, reasons uh, for that. One, in putting pressure on uh, other uh, large emitters and that are that import uh, to the U.S. Uh, and, and to protect uh, U.S. industries that are perceived uh, to uh, being uh, harmed by um, 
uh, potential uh, imports from areas with uh, uh, carbon controls or environmental safeguards that are not on par uh, with the US. Uh, we do see, even though President Biden has called for a carbon border adjustment, we really are uh, here in the early stages. Uh, the US uh, trade representative uh, noted uh, in a report that they submitted to Congress uh, that they are, are beginning to consider a carbon border adjustment mechanism and that they will work with their allies. Uh, but there hasn't been a really detail on what that will look like uh, as well. Uh, John Kerry, uh, during last month's uh, Climate Leaders Summit, also reiterated uh, his uh, desire uh, and support for the U.S. to adopt a, a CBAM and work with their allies. But again, uh, not a lot of detail uh, to date on, on uh, how that would look. It, I think, uh, the, and Gail mentioned this in, in, her, in her question, you know, one of the challenges is the fact that the U.S. right now and likely for the foreseeable future uh, does not have a carbon pricing regime uh, any, uh, that at all, um, and certainly not uh, anything comprehensive to what we have in the EU. Um, there have been uh, some carbon pricing bills that have been introduced over the last several years. Uh, that uh, have uh, border adjustment provisions as part of those bills. Um, those could serve uh, potentially as a, as a model uh, for executive action uh, that the U.S. Trade Representative or the USTR uh, would have to take to implement this uh, and, and work with uh, U.S. allies across the world. Uh, but that clearly is, is going to pose a lot of uh, policy, legal, uh, uh, practical and, and political challenges uh, going forward. So uh, a lot more to come here in the U.S. Um, over the coming months. I just would note that the U.S. Trade Representative uh, Catherine Tai uh, has uh, strongly underscored that climate change is going to be a, a central part of U.S. trade policy uh, under her, her leadership um, over the coming months and, and years. So I'll stop there and, and, and turn it back over to Gail. Great, thank you. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so that's great because I get to ask them then. Um, I, I'm on the board of uh, two uh, US-based companies. One has significant international distribution. Um, so what, what strategies, how are you all advising clients um, uh, for, you know, companies in industries that are likely to be brought within the scope of CBAM, uh, what should they be thinking about and what should they be doing or planning uh, in response to what we anticipate will be the EU's proposals? Vikram, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gail. Um, well, maybe let's just be clear on, on the impact um, that a CBAM could have on, on industry elsewhere. So coming back to the diagram I showed earlier, in principle, um, all you're really doing is replacing the shield um, that EU industry currently benefits uh, from um, with, a, with a tax um, borne by importers. So in principle, you know, th th there's still a level playing field. Th th there's no difference in the ability of a steel company, say in China, to compete against EU produced steel. Um, and if there is a difference, it's because, as I mentioned, um, that the shield provided by the EU currently has some holes in it. It doesn't cover all emissions um, and the EU carbon price is rising. Um, so if a CBM were to come into, into play, um, there are a number of strategies industries could take. Um, you know, one could obviously be to, to do nothing, wait for it to get challenged uh, at WTO. Uh, and hope that it gets rid of it, but but the pressure I think to do something will not will not go away. Um, you know, the other option could be to adapt to um, the CBAM, and, and there are different possibilities for that, uh, which could include reshuffling your inputs. So notionally using say hydropower to produce your aluminium rather than coal fired coal fired plants or switching away from the export of primary goods, more likely uh, to be covered by the CBAM to a finished product that isn't covered. Um, so 
I think assuming that the EU could, could, could get the CBM through, I think you could imagine that it might view such, um, such ways of adapting as maybe possible ways of circumventing um, the CBM. Um, and I think long term, I think um, you, you might try to fight those events, uh, fight those attempts, sorry, to circumvent it. Um, I think probably you know, if we look sort of longer term, um, the world significantly needs to reduce emissions. So I think a more sustainable adaptation strategy for industry might be to invest in the technologies that might help to reduce emissions um, rather than running the risk of possibly stranded assets in, in fossil technologies. Andrew, is that what you're seeing uh, some of the US-based companies are thinking? I mean, we have a number of very large companies that have big global footprints. Um, so they may have be headquartered in the US and on the New York Stock Exchange or on NASDAQ, but obviously they uh, both manufacture and trade all over the world. What, what, are, what are they thinking about at this point? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it varies uh, company to company. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of interest uh, in general uh, about how this develops. You know, I would say the experience of, of uh, last year with COVID-19 um, has, has necessitated a reassessment both politically and I think in the business world of reshoring supply chains. Uh, and you see that particularly in the energy sector, you know, there were holdups in, in um, some renewable energy projects um, and other deliveries in the broader sector. Um, so I, I think there's a recognition that this carbon border adjustment mechanism is not dissimilar from that broader reassessment of, of, of supply chains. Um, I think there's certainly, to the extent that the U.S. can work with Canada, the U U.K. and the EU, um, you know, more Western-based companies, there's, there's, I think, a, an opportunity in, in some of the folks that I talk about to perhaps um, gain a little bit of a, a competitive advantage. But as you, as you know, Gail, um, manufacturing is global. Um, and, and as such, there is, I think, um, concern, particularly on the details of, of how the, all these policies um, develop over, over the coming years. Nancy, what are you hearing from U.S. companies that have large footprints in China, for example? There are a number of them. Are, are you, how are they focusing on this issue? Um, yes, uh, for the U.S. company, definitely, because um, uh, many of them, there are um, multi, uh, uh, they, they actually have the footprints globally. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, so they keep um, a close eye on that. Uh, but uh, there are some kind of a, a, a different sort of a voices towards uh, this uh, CB. Uh, AM because uh, some of them they they believe that it is a, probably a way of uh, protect the EU uh, economy <laughs> uh, rather than uh, really kind of a, a, to control the leakage uh, of the carbon uh, emission uh, and um, uh, on, on the other hand uh, because the the China market is kind of uh, developing the uh, national ETS. And also in the past, there has been uh, several years for the regional uh, market uh, development. So they also kind of are quite keen to know how fast that the national ETS can be set up and can have the equivalent market as um, it has in the EU. Uh, if say in the future, uh, once the, um, the CBAM is released uh, as planned uh, and also uh, coming to effect in uh, 2023, uh, there's still like uh, two or three years to go and um, uh, China develops quite quickly and also um, uh, the, the market has already been started setting up. Uh, so they, they are quite keen to, to know whether, uh, for example, like uh, three years later that uh, the, the, the market here is mature enough to be sort of uh, uh, as the equivalent as the, in, in the EU. So. Um, as I said, this is a still uh, early stage, and um, uh, the good way would be to keep a close eye on the development on both sides. Yeah. Um, Mark, Adam, or Celine, do you have any further comments? Uh, obviously, you are very close to the CBA and proposals. Um, 
you were on site for what will be the COP26. Any, any further words of advice? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Gail. I, I think there's one very important aspect of this, which I'm sure our audience will be aware of, and that is the, the growing role of environment, social and governance compliance, the, the so-called ESG. Practically every major corporation now has an ESG policy. And of course, shareholders are uh, drawing attention to climate change to those uh, uh, companies on the front line in the energy sector, for example. Uh, and uh, it's certainly in the EU, uh, there is a major now preoccupation with the green transition and the, uh, the recognition that climate change has to be um, mitigated. I, I think companies are now investing a, a lot of money in their own internal corporate compliance programs and developing their own climate uh, uh, policies to reduce their emissions and to uh, prepare for what eventually may well be an international arrangement uh, to control carbon em emissions in a realistic way. And in that context, I think uh, uh, our offices around the world are increasingly receiving uh, requests for information on what's going on in the EU and how that will impact in their countries. And of course, it's not just the EU, as we've heard today, it's China, the US, uh, Canada, many other countries in the world are focusing on how to address climate change and so are their companies. Thank you. But, but you clearly have been leading this effort. Adam or Celine, any final, any final thoughts for our audience? I mean, the interest is, is clearly out there worldwide. I, I got an invitation to, to speak to an audience in Korea about this subject next week. So you know, people, people are, 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 are very um, focused. Clearly, that the strategies that people can adopt depend a lot on you know, what the shape of the, of the, the legislation ends up being, you know, whether you can seek competitive advantage uh, by being you know, greener, than, greener than the average um, you know, US or, or, or Chinese steel manufacturer, for example, is going to depend on whether the, the, the EU regime you know, uh, allows cognizance of that, of that kind of thing or whether it just treats, you know, treats, treats everyone the, the same. Uh, and the, you know, there's a huge amount of information and uh, to, to be managed and, and verified. It's, 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 there's, there's a big, you know, big infrastructure there. But at the same time, the people, uh, yes, it takes time to develop the, the scheme, but it also takes, you know, it takes time for people to, to make those investments decisions. If someone's looking now at, I don't know, turning their, um, their steelworks green by using hydrogen, that's not something you do overnight. Um, so, yeah. Celine, any, any thoughts? Everything has been said already. Um, just, I would just say, oh, yes, Adam. No, I was just going to say one thing. I saw someone popped in the Q&A and asked a question about um, ah. uh, voluntary emissions reductions. Uh, the answer to that question is, call Jeff Fort in our Chicago office. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Celine, what were you going to say? No, I was just uh, going to uh, say that in, indeed Mark and I are in Brussels right now and we have the privilege to, to, to see in front lines all the opportunity and challenges that the CBAM uh, will raise and actually raise already. Um, so like to say, Nessie, just a, a few minutes ago, my only advice now for, for all companies is to closely monitor all the 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 new proposal uh, that that will come uh, normally mid-July, but of course uh, we are never aware of a new postponement. But um, so yeah, and maybe uh, a further new webinar with the same brilliant team with panelists uh, to to explain the further monitors. That's all for me. Thank you, Gail. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. We may have to reconvene as this clearly is going to unfold. Um, CBM BAM is obviously important and it clearly presents many challenges, including some that, uh, you know, how it will trigger the WTO as well. Um, so stay tuned. Obviously this is unfolding uh, daily. We're gonna look at what happens in the UK tomorrow, um, but we have a, a huge sort of a number of experts that are on the ground all around the world with Denton's 
um, and Frontier Economics. Thank you, Vikram, for joining us today. Uh, and we will closely monitor this, uh, call us and uh, stay tuned for uh, possibly another webinar as, uh, as this unfolds. Uh, clearly more to come. Uh, we hope you have a good rest of the day and thank you for joining us.